Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. In every plausible scenario for a low-carbon future, even those produced by oil and gas companies, electrification grows substantially from just over 20% of final energy use now to dominating the energy system. My guest this week has been a standard bearer for the idea that to get to net zero, we have to, in his words, electrify everything. Let's meet engineer, inventor, advisor, author, and 2007 MacArthur genius, Saul Griffith. Before we start, if you're enjoying cleaning up, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and leave a review. That really helps others find us. Follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn to participate in the discussion, and make sure that you sign up for the Cleaning Up newsletter on Substack. It contains alerts about upcoming episodes and thoughts from Bryony and me on the issues covered. You'll find it at cleaninguppod.substack.com. That's cleaninguppod, all one word, dot substack.com. Finally, visit our archive of over 150 conversations with the world's climate leaders at cleaningup.live. That's cleaningup.live. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, as well as by the Liebreich Foundation, the Gilardini Foundation, and our newest supporter, Ecopragma Capital. So, Saul, thanks very much for joining us here on Cleaning Up. Thanks for having me. Should be fun. So we always start with um, our guests describing themselves, the short version, please, because you've done so much, but the short version, the one-liner on who you are, uh, what you do. Uh, grew up basically destined to be an engineer, trained in metallurgy and worked in a blast furnace as my first job. Went to MIT, did a PhD in physics types things, and then spent the last 25 years building energy technology companies in Silicon Valley and in my most recent career move, founded Rewiring America, Rewiring Australia, now Rewiring New Zealand as well, which are advocacy groups for the electrification of everything and trying to speed up this energy transition. Very good. And uh, for those who are listening on the podcast, they will not see it. But those who are watching on YouTube would be able to see over my left shoulder there is your book, which is called Electrify. There we go. So we can give your book a uh, we can give your book a plug. Get it? I I like that. Um, it gave me a charge. And when you said that, uh, just also uh, a couple of books I've written since then. One called The Big Switch. Unfortunately, I only have the Chinese translation on me, and uh, a long essay on community electrification and its role in economic renewal okay so let's recap we've already uh, set off at a canter let's uh, recap um, so you have an engineering and science hard science and engineering background um, you've been an inventor and you're very proud of that that's in your in your bio you always called the uh, engineer and inventor but you're also a writer and an activist for electrification so let's take that as a starting point why electrification I became deeply fascinated in energy systems in the early 2000s and was trying to understand what we knew about the energy system and what you could use that knowledge for in terms of decarbonization. That led to studying all of the energy flows in the US and the global economy at sort of an unprecedented resolution, if you like, and that's really the topic of the book, Electrify. And really, as you look at all of the energy flows, whether it's energy that's going to be used in an abattoir or energy that's going to be used on a school bus or energy that's going to be used in people's homes, and you think, okay, how do we do that service, that energy service, but do it in a way where there's no decarbonization? Our really only practical decarbonization technique for nearly all of those energy flows is electrification. So that's why the book was called Electrify and why I'm trying to break through the into the policy and the regulatory environment to simplify what we need to do for climate, because I think there's still a lot of governments in the world and a lot of 
bureaucrats who are a little bit confused by loud misinformation on what might decarbonize yet really you know 75 percent 80 percent of the heavy lifting on climate change is going to be electrification okay now um your book has got in it some fantastic diagrams some of the people listening to this will know what a sankey diagram is i and love some all of you not. all three of you <laughs> All three of you who know or all three of you who don't? What do you reckon? What's the ratio? Well, maybe on your show, it's a few hundred who know Sankeys. And that, that's, that makes think me feel on, really happy. I think on my show, I'm going to go with 60% having some vague idea what a Sankey diagram is. Um, but why don't, you, why don't you explain what is a Sankey diagram? A Sankey diagram was named for Captain Phileas Ryle Sankey, who was looking at the energy flows of coal through to propulsion of a steam-powered ship that he had at the turn of the century. And you could see in that a huge amount of the burned coal would would go off in one of the flows as waste energy because you just lose it as heat, and then a small amount of it would become tractive power for the boat. And that's the first known use of the term Sankey associated with diagram. It became popular in the 70s as a way to understand energy flows at the moment in history when the world first turned its attention to energy problems because of the energy crisis of the 1970s. And since then, every year, the US Department of Energy and also Lawrence Livermore Laboratory publish, a, you know, if you're an energy wonk, I'm sure you know it, the annual Energy Sankey Diagram. Um, but it's pretty low resolution, just looks like how much energy goes to industry, how much to uh, transportation, how much to residential sector and i did a fairly ridiculous project to look you know down to, we tried to track energy flows down to about 0.1 percent of flow through the u.s economy so literally be able to identify the refrigerators and the school buses uh and the energy used in other things like how much energy is used to process natural gas for example and just for those who are trying to visualize this, and what we'll do is in the YouTube version, if you can provide some of your favorite Sankey diagrams, some of the ones from the book, we'll cut them, we'll edit them into uh, the uh, YouTube. But of course, I'll have to just do a bit of performative dance here for those, uh, or verbal performative dance. There we go. Uh, we'll, um, th that's what they look like. Uh, but for those who are listening to the podcast, I'll do verbal performative dance. Um, if you remember, everybody, the famous chart that showed how many troops Napoleon started with, 400,000 troops started in France, went over to Moscow, and at every point, every battle, every disease was losing troops and eventually came back with, I believe, 10,000. And that famous visual graphic, it wasn't called a Sankey uh, because Mr. Phineas, whatever his name was, Sankey hadn't done the steam engine, but it's that sort of a chart that shows where you start with stuff and where you end with stuff. Now, people who listen to um, lots of my shows and read my stuff will know that I am... I have an obsessive hatred for primary energy, but these charts, they all start on the left with primary energy, don't they? What's wrong with that? Uh, there's a lot of things wrong with it. I think we are struggling with, our, with an honest conversation about climate solutions, starting with how we understand energy. So primary energy traditionally is the measure of, you know, tons of coal, thousands of cubic feet of natural gas, barrels of oil. Um, in the 70s, for the first time, we had to figure out, well, how do you put hydroelectricity in primary energy? How do you put nuclear power in primary energy? And so this actually was the first introduction of errors into how we think about primary energy, because the way the Department of Energy defined hydroelectricity's primary energy was if all of the if there's no rain and the dams fail, how much coal plant do you need to put on to substitute for the hydroelectricity? So what that led to, because of the inefficiency of coal, was a tripling over-reporting of the amount of hydroelectricity. Then, of course, because you only get about 1% of the energy, primary energy out of uranium when you do traditional uh, fission reactors, um, they didn't use the primary energy in the uranium at all. They threw that out and they just used the heat value. Or in fact, the primary energy is the electricity you get out 
minus the inefficiency of the steam cycle in the nuclear power plant, because otherwise it would have made the whole chart ridiculous. And because of those definitional problems, this is the, probably the best news we'll get tonight, the primary energy is overreported by about 7 or 8%. So we need 7 or 8% less energy than you think, just from the beginning. Of course, what we really care about is useful energy, which is on the far right-hand side of the Sankey diagram. So from primary energy, that goes into sectors traditionally, and those sectors were defined, like we said earlier, industry, residential, commercial, transportation, and electricity, which is considered its own special sector, unusually. Uh, and then you start to think, well, what happens underneath that residential sector? Well, that's where we drive, um, you know, that's where we heat our homes and we cook our dinners and we turn our lights on and we play video games. And the transportation sector is everything from air travel to ferries to cars to trains, mostly cars. Um, and industry is industry is very confusing in itself. For example, all of the mining of fossil fuels energy goes under industry, all of the processing. So three or four percent of US energy is using oil to process oil into gasoline and diesel. About one percent of US energy flow, which counts under industry, is using natural gas to push natural gas through about 1.2 million miles of pipeline. So actually about 10% of the energy use in the US is processing and transporting fuels. So that also makes a it makes the starting with primary energy sort of not a very easy way to understand the system. Uh, I'm still in a little bit of a fight with the people at Lawrence Livermore who published one of the Sankeys. They were critical that I came out and said America, if all electrified, would only need 42% of the primary energy that they think they do. And that's without using any of the traditional efficiency measures that people sign up for. So efficiency measures are insulate your house, drive a smaller car, eat like a vegetarian. Those, those are traditional efficiency things, or the last one's dietary. But... If you merely drove electric cars, the same oversized size that American cars are, and if you merely heated their oversized homes with heat pumps and did all the things sensibly and electrically, you could, in fact, run the entire economy thinking, I think, is the way you'd like to think about it from the demand side or where we use the energy, using only about 42% of the primary energy that we think we use. Right. And... Um... One of the last episodes uh, of Cleaning Up was um, uh, the second part of a two-parter. I gave first the reasons we should be pessimistic about the transition, which was the five horsemen of the transition. And then I did the five superheroes of the transition. Um, and the fifth and final superhero was what I call the primary energy demand fallacy. Uh, and that is that we have to replace this thing called primary energy demand. Now, you've just described the way that Lawrence Livermore and the, uh, I think the US Energy Information Administration does this adjustment for um, hydro and wind and solar and kind of multiplies by about three to make it to say, well, this is what it would require in coal to replace them. But the IEA, the International Energy Agency does not do that. So when they talk about primary energy demand, they add a whole bunch of coal that you shovel out of the uh, the mines, and they add that to just the electricity that's produced by solar and wind and hydro. So it's even more distortive because what you've got is not only do you have all the wrong numbers because you count the waste heat from the thermal, from uh, Coal, but oil, uh, but but you also then massively underestimate the impact of the actual electrified the, the, those technologies that just produce electricity rather than waste heat. So I have this. I go into this um, number five, the primary energy demand fallacy, and I show I give a few examples for how you can get the same amount of lighting with something like 95% lower primary energy demand if you have an LED light bulb. Um, powered by solar power. And the figures for transport and heating are about 75% lower. So you've, adver you've averaged, and there's some different numbers, different methodologies, but you came up with this figure 42% um, that, that we're only trying to replace 42% of 
the US definition of primary energy, correct? Yeah, and 42 is a little bit more accurate than I really mean, but it is the result of if you look at every one of the 100 flows that we looked at, um, if we use more heat pumps, it'll be a little bit less. If we use fewer heat pumps, it'll be a little bit more. Uh, very likely, we the lowest cost pathway for the energy transition is to have an oversupply of wind and solar. Putting more in than you need is cheaper than storage in many applications. So how are we going to report the oversupply and the overinstall? So there's a lot of problems with trying to square to the to this primary energy system methodology, which was written into stone in the 70s, first by the EIA, then by the IEA, and cut and paste. And we've been, every government in the world is sort of still using that terminology and still sort of looking at the problem wrong. So uh, the question I love to ask people who come up with primary energy and they talk about it is exactly what, what question does it answer? So you've got this metric of primary energy or primary energy demand, as it's called by the IEA. What question does it answer? Because in the 1970s, it asked, answered a very simple question. We've got this economy over here and we need to shovel resources into it. Have we got enough basic resources? But the problem today is very different. The problem today is we've got some energy services we need. How do we fulfill them cleanly? And I just don't know how primary energy of any sort answers that question. I think it's a case of we we measured the thing that was most easily measurable and the thing that was most easily measurable by economists. Barrels of oil. So a lot of these statistics come from trade statistics. Um, you have to remember that the IEA was originally an oil and gas uh, cartel. <laughs> and so they've been very strongly interested in using the language of of those fuels that they represented. So I think the EIA and the IEA for different reasons had a, a, a blind spot for thinking about it in terms of useful energy at the end of the line. Um, so I, I, you know, I think I just, I violently agree with you. We're, we're not looking at the problem, right? We still have most governments in the world trying efficiency measures. So if you think about the 1970s, it was an oil crisis in the US. They were missing 15% of primary energy because of the Arab oil embargo. They very quickly did project independence. How do we become energy independent? And there were two thrusts to that. One, try to figure out how to make more oil and gas. And they were even considering, believe it or not, using nuclear, <laughs> nuclear warheads for fracking was one of the projects that they funded in the 70s. Um, but they really arrived at in a policy response efficiency let's make if because if you made every oil boiler 15 percent more efficient every car 15 percent more efficient that would give you those efficiency wins that gave us the cafe corporate average fuel economy standards that gave us the energy star appliances so they that was the policy response and we still recommend, and in fact, there's still that terrible 2008 McKinsey paper that told everyone that the cheapest thing you could do was efficiency, but this is really not true. If you take your average house, it doesn't really matter where you are, it would be a twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 quite inconvenient retrofit to put insulation everywhere and a few thousands of dollars to put in a heat pump, which will lower the heat energy need by a factor of three. So I, th I think we're... It has also led us to be chasing efficiency where it's not all, always the fastest nor the most economic choice. So I have a, 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 something of a running battle with this point about the heat pump versus the fabric improvement, because there's this thing called fabric first, which is started as a kind of cute mantra, but it's become almost a religion. And I'm, I've now invented a hashtag fabric last, not because I don't like energy efficiency, not because I don't like loft insulation or wall cavity insulation or better windows, um, but because when the moment you say energy first, you then, as you say, you're unleashing this kind of 20, 30, 40,000 pound, very disruptive project as a condition of installing a heat pump, which it's not. And so Fabric Last is my way of promoting a kind of discussion and a debate and get people riled up so they actually try to think about it. But many of them don't. For them, they just think it's 
an, an outrageously sort of counterproductive to, to, of me to say this. Well, I, I remember my good friend David Mackay, sad that he has left uh, this world, and he was always, well, the most efficient heating system is an electric blanket, and he's true, just very locally heat you. Um, but I'm not sure. That's a little bit too prescriptive, I think, for the, everyone in the population. And you probably don't know this about me. My father was a textiles engineer, so I grew up around textiles, and we actually made uh, like a polar fleece lofting fabric that would change its insulation with temperature. So as it got colder, it would be warmer, and as it got warmer, it would be cooler. So we were trying a little bit of, not fabric first, but fabric at least, making a contribution. But, uh, you know, honestly, your your summary is right. We should meet people where they are and we should recognize where the huge efficiency win actually is, and that's in electrification. I was going to say, so you wrote this book about electric blankets called Electrify. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm those who are on the podcast won't see I'm smiling broadly. Um, but talk about how do we electrify? We've talked a little bit about heat pumps, um, electric vehicles. Um, now, in your book, you sort of, they, they seem to be a universal good. You just state, we need to electrify vehicles. Um, but that's a controversial statement, partly controversial, I suspect, because some people are um, raising all sorts of objections for entirely venal reasons. But how good are electric vehicles? I should say we could solve climate change. This is what doesn't come across in the summary of the book, and I, I couldn't quite write this in the book, but there's a little, the end chapter has it. We could now solve climate change, yet still destroy all of the species that we share the planet with. I think there was, at one point, there was 1.2 million Tesla Cyber trucks pre-sold. They weigh close to three metric tons each. If you multiplied one by the other, they would weigh as much as all wild mammal life or half as much as all of the wild mammal life on Earth. Right, but they're made of rocks, no? I mean, I think they're a horrible, ugly, appalling thing, and uh, and I'm not. I'm going. I'm I not agree with anything. you. They're made of rocks, yeah, and there's a lot them, of the rocks. Made of rock. There's enough of the rocks, but if you you know, what is the number one killer of birds in the world? It's being struck by a vehicle. Um, so I think our cars are universal good. No, our cars kind of amazing. Yes, our electric cars much much more amazing than internal combustion engine cars. Yes. All of these things can be true. Um, I have some sympathy that we should elect to use some other forms of transport. You know, America is going to try and solve climate change with electric 4x4s and pickup trucks. Um, that isn't the cheapest way, but it is in a very American way. Um, let's go through the other big chunk is um, industry. How do you electrify all of industry? Because, you know, I do think, and I've been doing this for about 20 years, you know, the electric, the electrical grid or the electrical system is going clean, right? That's pretty much, um, you know, we know how to do that and it's progressing well. Transportation, um, electric vehicles, obviously, we always have to say, but of course, it's better to walk and cycle and take public transport, but there. We've talked about heating, but the next big chunk is industry. And how do you get that to go electric? Well, some of the industries already are. So aluminium, which is a very useful metal, is made through electrochemistry and electrolytically. Um, and we can just clean up the electricity supply and pretty much have green aluminium, except there is some carbon dioxide from burning the electrode but electrodes, there are processes yes. now where that electrode doesn't have to be carbon. So we have pathways to green aluminium. The other big offenders in industry, well, a huge amount is all the energy used to process, find, mine and refine fossil fuels. So we eliminate all of that by moving to zero carbon electrification. Pretty much that leaves food and agriculture, steel, cement, and a couple of other very small contributors as the as the last big contributors. I think steel's you know depending on who's counting six eight six seven or eight percent of global emissions, and concrete's six seven or eight or nine percent, uh, and agriculture again depending who's counting is ten to twenty. 
But um, you've got you've got things like glass, you've got ceramics, you've got a lot of high temperature processors, which currently use a lot of possibly coal in in China, but but basically gas. Right. So a lot of them you'll be able to heat um, inductively. Uh, for the, some of the glasses, you might need hydrogen, or you could use biogas. Um, in the US, if you collected all of the waste food, all of the waste sewage, all of the waste agricultural biomass and waste forestry biomass, that would create about 10% of the US primary energy in an oil equivalent or a gas equivalent. So you probably don't need that much to do all of the high heat in industry. Um, steel making, for example, you use hydrogen a little bit for the reductant, but also a little bit for the high heat. But there are completely electrochemical pathways to steel making as well. The reality is that we don't have the answers for industry commercially available today at scale. This means for countries that are writing policy, they're still countries are typically concerned when they write policy about job creation and the industries that lobby the governments very hard. So they're very noisy about we want discounts for industry to decarbonize. But if you're prioritizing the earliest emission reductions you can, because that's what we must do, early emission reductions count more, we would be focused in the next decade is about electric vehicles and electrification of building heat. And hope, honestly, what we're really doing is praying that that decade gives us enough time to dot the I's and cross the T's and bring up to scale uh, those industries that are still challenging. But when you say um, we'll hope and we'll dot the I's and cross the T's, I mean, if you've got um, uh, a process that requires heat and it's currently using gas, just on an energy content basis, sort of dollars per therm or BTU or kilowatt hour, electricity would have to be, if you've got the US let's call it $3 per million BTU, which is the, the, the BTU is a British thermal unit, dollars per million BTU is how gas tends to trade around the world, but certainly in the US. And the price, I think at the moment, is actually under two. But the metric I know is if it's $3, you need $10 a megawatt electricity to replace it. $10 per megawatt, uh, that's one cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, and it has to be reliable electricity. For a lot of these processors, high temperature processors don't like running intermittently. So when are we going to get $10 per megawatt hour, one cent per kilowatt hour, dispatchable 24-7, 365 clean electricity? I don't think we will. I think you're thinking about the problem in the right way. Uh, I was just pulling up a spreadsheet I've been working on this week, which is trying to track the price of all of the different fuels from what you would call the supply side all the way through to the demand use. So a barrel of oil, you know, what the marginal cost of production of Saudi oil is nine US dollars a barrel, which is two tenths of one cent per kilowatt hour equivalent. Uh, natural gas, yeah, like you said, wellhead gas at 250 per thousand cubic feet is again, a quarter of one penny per kilowatt hour equivalent. Even if they are burned very inefficiently, it's still under a penny. The only way you will get electricity that cheap, and we, I, I'm living in Australia currently, is when you have overproduction. And so the price of electricity is now negative in Australia most days for multiple hours. So I can imagine a future. So the, the conversation in Australia isn't how do we get to 100% renewable? It's are we going to be 300, 600 or 900% renewable? How much of that excess renewable energy will we use for uh, industry and exports? But once you have more than 100%, which is what you need for 100% reliability, so you need more than 100% capacity for 100% reliability, you will have long periods of the year and long periods of every day where the price of electricity is negative if you are close enough to it, meaning you're not paying the, the transmission costs and the distribution costs, which are actually what dominate in the real price of electricity. So then you can start to imagine, provided, and you've said it well, if you have capital and industrial processes that can run intermittently, I can imagine a future where you get 
too competitive with that natural gas price. But if you are still designing your processes to run 24-7, then that won't be true. But you have to remember that we designed a lot of industrial processes to absorb overnight coal. So a lot of night shifts are actually a product of having coal as a dominant source in your electricity sector because you can't shut it down overnight, so you have very, very low cost overnight. So we might, in fact, solve a lot of these industrial problems, A, through oversupply, which will give you zero marginal cost electricity, and B, changing the shift schedules in the same way that we changed them in the 20th century to shift towards um, where coal was cheapest. So there's a, a short little sentence or a couple of sentences in your book, which are rather endearing where you admit that you're not the best macroeconomist and you say that there are other people much better at macroeconomics. Um, I've been brushing that, up. Just, <laughs> I have indeed. I've, I've read your book. I can't. I, no, I I've been brushing notes. up on my macroeconomics. Oh, so you've I'm, been brushing up. Yes, I'm, I've been brushing up on you. You've been brushing up maybe on economics. But this is this idea that because um, you're, you're confusing price and cost there, aren't you? In that that oversupply, somebody has to pay for it. So, you know, it may be that it's a cross subsidy between um, the consumer, retail consumer and industry or something. But, you know, I know investors and if you tell them you're going to build an enormous amount of oversupply and you're going to do it to serve the ceramics, the glass, the smelting, the et cetera, et cetera, industry. And by the way, they're not going to pay you for that power. Right. I can tell you the investors I know, they're going to say, I don't think so. Um, this is what investors are already doing. So I think you're wrong. They just don't, they don't know how to express what is going on. So they're investing gobsmacking amounts of capital in industrial wind and industrial solar. And a huge amount of that is destined to be cast off as negatively priced electricity. But the whole net price of the project will level out at some LCOE of three, four, five, six, seven cents a kilowatt hour. But what you said is actually right. Really, and I think about this a little bit more in the terms of the Australian economy right now than the American economy or others, because Australia is ahead of this curve compared to most countries, because we have 35% penetration of rooftop solar. So that, that creates negatively priced electricity at two o'clock every afternoon. But the consumer will pay an awful lot for the wee hours when there is no wind and there is no sun, but they, those consumers will actually be providing industry with zero marginal cost energy when we're at the peak. So the levelized cost, so if you finance rooftop solar in Australia, which is installing on the rooftop at about 55 US cents per watt, Think about that. It's a one quarter or one fifth of the price it is installing in the US. That is delivering electricity at two or three US cents per kilowatt hour behind the meter to the Australian household. You add batteries at six or seven hundred dollars a kilowatt hour that do five thousand cycles to that, and you've got hardened electricity at you know ten or fifteen cents, half the price of what the grid delivers. This is the world we're entering. That's a, not a technological win in Australia, but a regulatory win. And our sunshine is good, but it's not twice as good as America. Um, but you can see those types of, you know, Britain will eventually have more wind than it can consume because of the massive deployment of offshore wind. And that will change the dynamics of industrial energy pricing. Right. But when you say that investors are already um, putting money to work, not on the rooftop stuff, um, but on these big projects, the answer is they're being paid whether that resource runs or not. Right. We have already got hundreds of millions of pounds of curtailment payments because we've already got more wind. We've got something like 12 gigawatts of offshore wind. We're supposed to go to 50 gigawatts by 2030. I mean, we won't make it, but we'll get close. And we're already having, you know, extended periods where there's too much wind. And then, of course, the problem with uh, cold countries is that the, the principal resource is wind, which doesn't just fall away overnight. It can fall away for 
weeks and months and you can have bad I'm, I'm, wind I'm quite years familiar so having on. started two wind energy companies with wind and I agree um, it isn't easy but you know we we do if you if you want the honest answer and this is why we are a little bit hoping and praying we there is no I do not know anyone who can predict nuclear solar wind or hydroelectricity coming in, in at a delivered to the furnace equivalent price of natural gas. So if you, those products price has to go up or you have to win the efficiency through electrification, which is possible unless it's a purely heat process like gas, where it's just, um, it's, you know, you don't, electricity is not going to be more efficient than burning gas for glass. Uh, so some products, the price will go up. Right. And, and I think where we're going with this, by the way, is policy responses, because I agree with you at the moment. You know, it's all very well to say, well, wind is, you know, wind is going to be cheap. Solar is going to be cheap. But there's going to be these things that it doesn't do. And you can say, well, let's wait 10 years and dot the I's and cross the T's. But realistically, and you've just said it, you've said the quiet part out loud, some things are just going to cost more, which means that there's got to be a policy response, not just to kind of help push down some costs, but a policy response that says, if you don't want, you know, even in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, if you don't want people burning gas to make glass or ceramics or some, the heat part of the cement emissions, you're just going to have to co close a cost gap. And you have to do it, of course, not just in Australia, which has got plenty of money, or the UK or the US with plenty of money. You have to do it in um, in, in Malaysia and in South Africa and in Indonesia and across Africa and so on. Everywhere in the world is going to have to just pay more. Is that not correct? Net, net, I think everywhere in the world will pay less. And I will defend that statement. But most places of the world will have to pay a little bit more for a few things. Um, all of the glass making and ceramic making of the world is a 1% type of problem, just to, so we can bound it. And I'm now going to violently agree with you that we are actually having a conversation about policy response. And I think I'm about to lose a drink to you because I'm going to say, unfortunately, most of the policy responses I see around industry around the world is hydrogen. The only good hydrogen, of course, is green hydrogen, which means you have to start with zero emission electricity, which means wind or solar or nuclear. But unfortunately, as you go into hydrogen, it's just a battery. It's not an energy source. You're going to lose at least a quarter, more likely 30 or 40 percent of your electricity when you create the hydrogen. You'll lose another 10 percent of it compressing it. You'll lose a few percent in transporting it, and then you'll lose a small amount up to 50% when you burn it again. So hydrogen as a policy response for industry necessitates at least five to 10 times the price of gas for the equivalent industrial heat. Yet all of the world's governments are addicted to the idea of hydrogen. Part of that has to do with the IEA. The IEA, again, started as a fossil fuel cabal. Where does all the hydrogen in the world come from? It comes from the gas industry. They've been very, very loud advocates they in fact predicted that 50 percent of the world's primary energy would be in hydrogen in 2050 a few years ago the most ridiculous like if you didn't lose respect for their modeling after that i don't know what would do it for you um and really a lot of the work i do now is fighting that because money spent on hydrogen now as an industrial response is not money decarbonizing in the short term and it's not going to end up being the decarbonizing technology in the long term bar a few industries where it is the only option, such as ammonia and fertilizer. So for those listeners and viewers who um, sort of spotted the reference to the drink, but didn't know what it referred to, <laughs> is in preparation for the conversation, I said, here's, the, here's hydrogen bingo, which I play in a lot of um, meetings. The first person to use the word hydrogen has to buy the drinks that evening. Um, and, um, you know, so... Saul has now officially lost hydrogen bingo. In I lost fact, hydrogen bingo, your... but I want to return to the important point. I modeled today. So if you model an Australian household in 2024, they use 100 and 
four kilowatt hours of all types of energy use. The majority of it is petrol and diesel or gasoline. Um, about 20% of that is waste heat lost burning coal or gas to make the electricity. If you electrified everything in that household, it would only need about 37 kilowatt hours per day. So that's less than 40% of the primary en primary energy. I'm using air quotes because I agree with you. It's not perfect as a measure. But that's an extraordinary efficiency win. Now, if you provided that, and the average Australian house quite easily can supply one third to two thirds of all of their annual energy with solar. So if they're using 50% with solar energy and they're getting the other 50% for the grid, paying full price grid prices, they would save about three to $4,000 per year on their total cost of energy. It actually means, and this is why I've been brushing up on my macroeconomics, because I now make arguments to government about the most efficient policy response. If you take the microeconomics of that household that can save money through financing the electrification, so we're going to bookmark that word financing because it's incredibly important to your question about Malaysia. But if Australia electrified all of the 37 million machines that households own that currently run on fossil fuels, and they did them at the rate at which they retire. So if you have a 10-year-old Volvo, in five years, it'll kick the bucket, replace it with an electric car. If your furnace is eight years old, replace it in four years when it replaced, etc. We would save $1.7 trillion as a nation by 2050 by replacing these machines as fast as they fail with electrified machines. Why is that a better picture in Australia? We've had the regulatory win on rooftop solar that makes it extremely cheap, although we're not cheaper than Indonesia, China, or Mexico on rooftop solar installations. So that is something available to most of the world. Our retail natural gas and our retail petrol and diesel is about 50% more expensive than America, maybe equivalent to Britain. Uh, and our um, electricity, you know, and we have a mild climate. So we've got sort of a perfect setup and probably one of the first countries in the world where that statement, at least for a huge part of the retail energy economy, which happens at residential and commercial buildings, it's now slam dunk economic win for a nation to go all in behind financing everyone to electrify everything. And you save that $1.7 trillion. Do I think that $1.7 trillion will offset the marginal extra cost we would have to pay for industrial heat that has to come from something other than natural gas? Yes, I think it's a net win. You could now, and I, the economics has flipped in New Zealand in the same way it has in Australia. The economics, is, I haven't done the analysis for Indonesia or Malaysia or Vietnam, but at the rate that they're installing solar and adopting electric motorcycles and three-wheelers, it is almost certainly true there. But you could probably draw a map of the world based on what is their retail oil and gas prices and what is their renewable installed cost and actually say, well, this is, this is the rate at which all of these countries you know, will get to decarbonization. I think America is probably five or 10 years behind because it hasn't had the regulatory win on solar and it has such profoundly cheap oil and gas. England is further behind, but for you, it's because of your challenging climate, climactic conditions. Nevertheless, the, the cost curves of the solar and the wind and the batteries that enable this are on track that it's fairly difficult to imagine any country that doesn't get there by, to this sort of economic turning point in, by the mid-2030s. Granted, Northern Europe and high population density countries in Asia probably have to have some nuclear in the mix to make it work. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's right. I, I, I like the way you've laid it out. Um, uh, it's not just England that's going to have the problem. I think Northern Europe, sort of dense population, industrialized and with, you know, winters. So I have solar on my roof in London. Um, it has to be east west for because of the way the roof is. And it produces one thirteenth as much energy during the winter at the, at the trough of the winter as it does during the summer. So, you know, any idea that I'm going to be heating my house using solar, and of course, wind really can fall away for extended period. So yeah. Japan is going to find it hard. Korea is going to find it hard. Europe's going to find it hard, you know, and then depending on how interconnected they are, places like uh, New England in the US is going to find it hard. Canada, 
it's going to be very hard to get Canada off fossil, given how cheap, you know, how, how cheap and how abundant their fossil is and how cold they are. Um, yeah, and so you, uh, that's going to be a real tough one. And But you've said it, interconnection is extremely important. Uh, some of this can be solved with geographic diversity. So um, over a thousand kilometer scales, it's always windy somewhere. And on a, you know, as you go a thousand, every thousand kilometers you go south or north towards the equator, you have that, by the way, you can hear a coal train passing by my house. So <laughs> I, that's, that's my personal motivation to get the world off coal. Um, but uh, it is hard to imagine a solution that doesn't involve moving electricity over thousands of kilometers north and south and so, east and west. So, so so I'm an investor in something called X-Links, which is from Morocco to the UK. And that is, of course, a north-south 3,800 kilometers high voltage DC subsea cable that I think is actually going to happen. Um, but of course, if you then say, well, what is 3,800 kilometers east-west, you actually get from the UK or certainly from Ireland to the PJM electricity market in the US. And east-west helps with time differences. North-south yes. helps a lot with um, with resource differences. Uh, it is yeah, the, hardest, hard. the, the hardest hour of the day in Australia is the east coast evening, which is exactly when Perth has its best wind and its best solar. And, you know, with a 4,000 kilometer link east west across Australia, we would make the problem much easier. So I want to come back to a couple of things that you mentioned. One is, um, you t one is just to kind of finish off on hydrogen since you're buying drinks. Um, <laughs> And and that is, there are these huge figures that have been proposed for the proportion of primary energy, to use that horrible um, construct, that will go into making hydrogen. As you say, IEA, I think at one point had 50%. 15% now seems to be a sort of consensus of the great and good. My own figure, and I suspect yours as well, is going to be 1% or 2%. It's really just going to be for the very, very difficult stuff. Um, so do you agree with that, that it's, you know, because then if it costs a lot, it's very small, so it doesn't really matter in the net net grand scheme of things. I you... blow a bound at one to two, which is pretty much just doing equivalent amounts of ammonia for fertilizer that we currently do. And it might be as high as 5%, depending upon what we get for steel and what we get for cement. I agree entirely with that. I was when I was saying one to two, I was thinking more in the energy system rather than as the current feedstock use. So it's kind of current use of a couple of percent plus maybe a couple of percent more. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to just note or let you comment on is this idea that you retire things when they require retirement at the end of their asset lives. Um, so I have, you talked about the um, the 10 year old Volvo. I have a 16 year old Volvo uh, and I can guarantee you, I will not be buying another internal combustion vehicle, but I'm not gonna get rid of it until there's an equivalent vehicle and I am fully, fully depreciated and the embodied carbon of my existing Volvo is fully used up. I think there's a small chance that you'll buy a mid eighties Volvo station wagon and electrify it just for nostalgia. Uh, that's my strategy right now. Um, I think I just bought myself for my 50th birthday a 1974 Alfa Romeo that's going to get a uh, Ford electric crate motor conversion. But um, to return to the question, which I think is something I think about a lot. So in corners of the climate universe, there's something known as committed emissions. So whether it's a coal plant, or whether it's a cement factory, or whether it's your 16-year-old Volvo, um, it still has a certain number of years, in the case of your Volvo, maybe four more years of an expected lifetime of 20 years. And so it is committed to emitting for another four years your driving. So is an old blast furnace that's got another 10 years on the liner, etc. Uh, I think there was a paper in 2020, which means that the numbers are worse now. But if you, um, the committed emissions of the world's machines took us to 1.8 degrees, I think around 2020. Um, the, this is, I'm going to tie a few thoughts. So hold that thought in your mind. 
we let the IPCC process after the scientists do the very good climate science work. It goes to sort of economists and modelers for how do you respond and, and what are the emission reduction trajectories. And in the mid 2000s, they discovered bioenergy with carbon capture and storage with an unfortunate BEX as the acronym. And they thought they could have a negative emission energy source. So you burn the biomass and then you capture the carbon dioxide and bury it. And nominally, that's negative emissions. Greta Thunberg summarizes this most brilliantly when she says, you know, you adults have just used accounting tricks to try and solve climate change. We put in 20 gigatons of negative emissions at the end of this century in the majority of pathways for one and a half degrees. Now, let me put 20 gigatons in perspective for the audience. All of the oil, all of the coal, all of the gas that we pull out of the earth every year weighs about 10 gigatons. So by necessity, we now want to bury twice as much stuff as the entire all fossil fuel industries combined and build that industry for, mind you, a negatively priced product by the end of the century. It is never going to happen. So this means that we actually have to go if you want one and a half degrees and you believe that the committed emissions are 1.8, you have to have not just perfect execution of replacing these machines at retirement, but you need to go faster than the market can. And the, the, you're, if you are a free market ideologue, you have to wrestle with the fact that the free market can't give you a climate outcome of one and a half degrees. So you need stimulus and things that go faster than that. And you really need to set the schedule for any human who you know as a friend. Oh, you know, I think you should electrify. You should, And then they say, oh, but I can't afford it this year. And you say, well, you know, when your 16-year-old Volvo dies in four years, then you should get the electric car. When your water heater packs it in in 10 years, then you get the heat pump water heater. When your stove packs it in or you do a kitchen remodel, then you should put the induction stove in. And that's what we need everyone in the world to think about as they think about their personal response to climate change. Now, a lot of the IRA in the US that I worked on with colleagues from all over the place, including the team we had at Rewiring America, we focused very much on how do you write policy and stimulus that helps make those decisions very, very easy. Whereas I like to think We've had 50 years of environmental wisdom, which is reduce, reuse, recycle, efficiency. That's going to save the dolphins. But that just gives you incapac incapacitating consumer guilt when you're in the supermarket because you, you, know, you can't read enough of the labels on the cereal box to know which one is better. Whereas the great majority of emissions in your personal life come from six decisions. Is your car electric? Do you have solar on your roof? Do you cook with electricity? Do you heat your water with electricity? Do you heat your house with electricity? And so and, what we need people to do is make one being, do you, sixth one presumably being, do you fly on holiday? I didn't mention that one. I can't remember what the sixth, I think it's the big five. They have the big five in Africa. So it's the big five of electrification. We need people to sort of start having, being on this mantra. And the, of, and the, sixth, the sixth is then flying to Africa to see the big to five. see the big five. Yeah. Which we're going to have to do on biofuels because, you know, hydrogen right. is not a great idea for aircraft either. But your, your, um, your point about retiring things at the end of life um, actually resonates with me. I was on the UK's Energy Efficiency Task Force, and I, was, uh, I actually chaired the piece on industrial energy efficiency uh, before it got um, uh, nixed by the government did this uh, reset, the climate change reset, and actually got rid of the task force, which was a huge shame, I think. Um, but one of the ideas that I was promoting through that platform was the idea of a living will for your heating system. And of course, you could apply it also to industrial heating systems or industrial systems. Um, so when your heating packs up, know beforehand how you're going to install a heat pump rather than your heating packs up, you're cold, you're under stress, your kids are screaming, uh, you can't have a shower. And of course, what you do is you put in another boiler. So if you have a living will for your system, then you would do what you're saying we need to do, which is at that point, which is the lowest cost intervention, um, rather than scrapping a stranded asset uh, too yeah. early, just at that point, make the switch. You're speaking my language. And as policy responses, you now have to acknowledge that 40% of water heaters are bought under financial duress. It's the middle of winter, your partner is pregnant or your mother is sick and you call 
a contractor or a tradesperson to replace your water heater and they're going to sell against the heat pump because what they have in the back of the truck is a gas thing and they know how to do that job. So we've got workforce issues and then of course even though the heat pump cost of ownership over the lifetime is very likely much lower than the gas, people make these decisions based on cash and you know in the US famously what is it the average house has $400 or 40% of households only have $400 of cash on hand. So most people don't have the credit facility available. This brings us back to the bookmark we had much, much earlier about finance, right? In Western countries, if you're in, you know, as I like to say, the most expensive Range Rover in Australia costs you $256,000. You could instead buy a $20,000, 20 kilowatt solar system. You could buy the heat pump, the water heater, the electric stove, do the same for your second house, um, buy batteries and the whole thing, you'd still have $100,000 left over to send the kids to private school. But that's only available to the people who are buying Range Rovers. How do you decarbonize the people in the you know the, the lower 50th percentiles, the bottom half? Um, and it's extremely important. And really, it's a finance issue because like that point I made earlier, the economics are now good over the lifetime of these products, but the economics... Is very difficult in cash up front, especially if you have poor credit rating or you're a single mother uh, between jobs. That you know, all of these issues are really where we're going to fail. Or you're in Malaysia and your government can't print money the way America can. Right, because all of this is uh, all clean energy. I think pretty much all of it, maybe not biofuels or bio solutions, but everything else is a huge amount of spending up front for no fuel costs. So whether it's nuclear, where, well, nuclear has a fuel cost, but it's still massive upfront, but solar is upfront, wind is upfront, energy efficiency is upfront, public transport is upfront, yeah, when insulation. You're, you're buying solar, upfront. you're buying 20 years of energy in advance. Right. So it becomes then, and in your book, you've written about how the solution is cheap mortgages and it's about finance. Now, the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US, didn't go down the direction of saying, well, let's just give people, you know, 1% or 2% or 3% loans to do the right thing. It... Uh, it, it, it works through tax, basically tax incentives. You get a tax break. So it distributionally, well, remember, IRA, by definition, it's only, going to hurt, it's only going to help certain people. Yes, this was a problem with the IRA, but it was handicapped politically because the Democrats didn't have a supermajority in the Senate and they weren't prepared to overturn the filibuster. So the only political option for a climate bill was a spending bill. So it's not legislation so much as a spending bill. And that meant really that, Everyone was working on these other bigger, fancier ideas, but it became, okay, how do you hack the tax code to achieve the effect? But by definition, as you've pointed out, it is a regressive piece of policy because you have to afford to pay enough tax to qualify. So what's the alternative then? Because um, I mean, in your book, you, I think you lay it out. You say it's all about mortgages and loans, but you know, isn't that going to be enormously inflationary? You're basically going to give cheap money to a whole bunch of people with poor credit ratings They'll do something which is good for the planet and for sustainability, but you are pouring money globally in the trillions into a system uh, that, that is essentially not equipped to deal with it. And you're going to have a huge, huge macroeconomic. I, do, I hope in your, um, in your uh, getting up to speed on macroeconomics, you've figured out how to deal with the inflationary surge that will result. I'm writing a paper with um, the chief economist of the Central Bank in New Zealand at the moment, and the title is, Is Electrification Anti-Inflationary? And for Australia and New Zealand, it is anti-inflationary. And think about it, because instead of spending $7,000 a year, a household, on buying fuels, you could spend about $2,000 on the finance for the full electrification kit. But that $2,000 is now fixed 20 years into the future because you've put it on finance, fixed modulo the indexation of your, your loan rate, whereas the fossil fuels have enormous volatility and they've actually over the last 25 years been increasing at a rate higher than the CPI. So literally fossil fuels define inflation, whereas there's this anti-inflationary effect of finance because it takes all the volatility out and it locks in your cost of future energy at what you're financing it at now. I can show you graphs and charts that we've looked at this. 
And there are serious economists now thinking about this. Um, and it is not clear that it is inflationary. Okay, so I've got um, a suggestion for the title, your title. Uh, what was the title that you said, the paper you're writing? Is Electrification Anti-Inflationary? Okay. How about calling it, how to, right, <laughs> call it How to Finance the Transition or How to Finance the Electrification? So I just found this in a bookshop. Um, those who are listening to the podcast, it's called How to Pay for the War. And it's by the great uh, economist, uh, John Maynard Keynes. And he would completely disagree with this voodoo finance, voodoo economics that you just come up with. Because when you pull forwards a whole chunk of economic activity and fund I'm it I'm reading the debt, price of peace right now, and I think Keynes would be on board. No, so what he said is during, if you wanted to finance all of the economic activity around the war, you need to raise a war bond. So you need to suck out demand from the economy elsewhere in order to finance the surge of activity. Um, and that, that seems, I mean, it's, it's a pretty uh, useful and interesting analogy. No, I, I, um, I, think, I don't think that's the right way to think about it. So I'm going to use the Australian case because I'm modeling this right now for the Australian government as a potential policy response. There are 11 million households. Those 11 million households will spend by 2050 around about $2 trillion buying cars, buying water heaters, buying space heaters, and buying kitchen cooktops. If you look at the cost curves of electric vehicles, the cost curves of heat pumps, hang on, hold on. If you but you're jumping to the easy bit, which is where where the solution is cheaper than the clean solution is cheaper in a capex terms than the dirty solution, right? No, no, no. But you have to spend about a hundred billion extend across the the economy. Yes, but we need to take advantage of those pieces of the economy that it does exist, and that is seventy five percent of the economy, which is the commercial and the residential and the transportation sectors. So it's the lion's share. Okay, and like I said, we have to buy ourselves ten years to get steel right. There is a chance that steel becomes cheaper if we have a Boston Metals fully electrochemistry pathway, right? So it's, it's, but we need to buy ourselves some time. I'm not trying to put that in the too hard basket. I'm trying to raise the urgency on what we know how to do. And I'm trying to focus the mind that this is no longer a technology problem. This is a regulatory problem. This is a financing problem. This is a supply chain challenge, and this is a workforce development challenge. Every country in the world is short tens or hundreds of thousands of electricians and skilled tradespeople to install all of these things. Um, and, you know, I was, to finish my sentence, you know, if we spent 2.1 trillion instead of 2 trillion over those that same period, you would have all electric kit and you would save 1.7 trillion. So the net benefit far outweighs the small, what we call green premium. Now, granted, like I said earlier, Australia is there first for structural reasons, but most of the middle of the planet is already there. Um, Central Asia, Africa, etc. So there's large swaths of the planet where this makes economic sense right now. Unfortunately, there are a lot of countries that have terrible access to finance. So we exactly. need something yeah. of a revolution in finance and we need you know, the new thinkers to go above and beyond Keynes to figure out how we do this. So let me just come in here. I think you're over-trading Australia, right? Because, you know, here you've got this country that's got, you know, enormous amounts of savings through the super funds. You've got loads of solar. You've got wind. You've got iron ore. You've got gas. You've got... So basically... I mean, you're saying, oh, we're going to do this in Australia and it'll pay for itself. It's fantastic. But I would flip it around and say, well, if you can't manage it in Australia, then we're really screwed elsewhere because you've got everything lined up in Australia in a way that actually, frankly, almost no other country in the world has. I think you're right. We're absolutely screwed if you can't do this in Australia. But you have to do this type of very large effort somewhere first and i think australia and new zealand look good if you look at if you if you think about it a bit more broadly any country that doesn't produce its own oil because the best energy price arbitrage of all is electricity versus retail gasoline or, or petrol right so i think 
at the you know you know Australian prices two dollars fifty a liter is about ninety cents a kilowatt hour equivalent. So you that's you make all your money against oil. So countries that don't produce their own oil are very likely ones that find out that this is a very good idea first. Australia imports fifty billion dollars a year in oil, so that you can make that go away and run run on five billion dollars worth of renewables. So there's you know of the there's only really about six serious oil producers. I think this is why America will struggle with this more than most, because they 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 still are close to being able to make cheap oil. But I think that means that there's a lot of countries, and for example, China is you know way ahead of its targets on electrification, deploying renewables, partly because it is trying to wean itself off the fossil fuels that are expensive. Right, but but okay. So we do a two by two matrix, and we've got countries with low interest rates that are oil importers, and it's basically Australia and uh, uh, and China. I mean, it's hard to think of that many others. Uh, actually, no. Uh, I suppose you've got all of uh, you've got Northern Europe and so on, um, Japan, Korea. No, I kind of like it, but. Uh, but you've also got something else going on in Australia. You've got all those natural resources. You've got this incredible uh, amount of money in people's savings, and you can fund it all by exporting fossil fuels, which is, of course, what your plan is. Your government's plan is fundamentally maybe to become virtuous well, in Australia. We're just, fo we're just following exporting. in the Norwegian footsteps there, let's be honest. Well, you're not following, you're actually leading, because if you go all the way back to um, the Kyoto Protocol, you know, even Norway said, yes, it applies to us. And Australia essentially said, no, it doesn't apply to us. In the last minute, count us out. The reductive version of your argument is um, that you can't save the world because you're trying to do business not as usual. And yes, I am, we are agreeing that Australia is a bit unusual. It can go first. But the, you, we're not going to find a solution for climate under two degrees unless the majority of countries figure out how we're going to do this financialization of the energy system. Because the, the switch from fossil fuels to electrification is from fuels to finance. So there's no getting around this being the problem. And no, I don't believe that any country in the world has the instruments to get it right. And, you know, I'm putting in some effort here. Uh, putting in some effort in other countries trying to figure it out, but we we need to figure that out, and it, and it will be new instruments. And if it's going to spread to, as you put it, some of the countries that struggle for structural reasons to have cheap access to international finance, we're, we're going to have to invent new systems. We're going to have to go beyond Bretton Woods uh, and America's dominance of the global finance um, to get there. Does that not just mean giving money away, though? Why is it giving money away? No, I haven't said give money away anywhere. I've said finance, which we all understand that finance is the money that you pay back. But, but yes, if, there's a risk, if there's a risk premium to invest in Africa or to invest in some of these countries because they are risky, and if you say, oh, we've got to stop America's dominance of the financial system, that's a very easy thing to say. But if it means not earning the risk premium on countries that are risky, then it is giving money away. I know what somebody, a family of four in Kenya has a 110cc motorbike as their family car. It's about a $1,400 motorbike. Uh, we're approaching having an electric motorbike equivalent power, equivalent performance that with the solar cells that would power that will come in under that $1,400. And at the microeconomics of that household, I'm not sure that presents any more risk than what they're doing currently. No, but if you, that's, first of all, I mean, you've, you've immediately jumped to a solution which is cheaper than the dirty solution, which is, of course, the easy stuff. But even so, if you we're have to We're having a conversation family, about the easy stuff tonight in order to have a conversation about the hard thing, which is finance. <laughs> so, because we could get distracted in industry all night and then it's, but, you know, it's, it's debating when you think we'll have electrochemistry for steel and what we're going to do about cement. Yeah. Whereas, you know, my urgency is buying us the time to get to those solutions by doing the things that we know how to do that will present a macroeconomic argument that it's going to save families, countries, regions money to do it. So we had an episode um, uh, with uh, Professor Avinash Persaud, who was 
uh, proposing the Bridgetown Initiative, and that's all about closing the financing gap between sort of it's, it's fine if you've got 5% finance in Australia or the UK or the US or Europe, uh, a Japan, Korea. But of course, if you're in South Africa, even where you've got 15% cost of finance or, uh, you know, some other countries. Oh, you're no dead, doubt, dead in the water if your finance is that, that The funny thing is he, he framed the question absolutely brilliantly, but then failed to come up, to my mind, with convincing answers. Now, we've reached that point in the conversation where two engineers are having an argument about macroeconomics. So I think we're probably done. We'll need to continue uh, the conversation over that hydrogen drink, which you have uh, promised to buy you. me. So, uh, next time you jump in your biofuel powered plane to come up to Europe, or I end up down in uh, Australia, uh, I would love to take you up on that offer. But it's been really wonderful talking to you. Uh, it has been fabulous. I think there's. I think we could go on about macroeconomics. We, we honestly, we know as much as the economists do. Well, I think that's the point with macroeconomics. Nobody can actually prove anything right or wrong because it's just this kind of social it, science. It, it does and, look like it's a religious debate when you get to the level of you know Keynes versus uh, Hayek, for example. Well, I haven't, I, I haven't uh, been able to channel Hayek and know what he thinks about climate change. I think in Hayek's world, there are no such things as environmental externalities. I'm not sure if he's got to that. Now, I'm probably going to get the comments fields filled on all social media, uh, and, and hopefully somebody will point out what Hayek did think about the environment. I know that Anne Rand certainly never had any clue that there were any externalities. Um, so anyway, fabulous talking to you, uh, and, and to be continued. Uh, thank you. Thank you to your audience. Um, hopefully there's a young economist out there who's going to turn this into a good idea. I'll go with that. Thanks very much, Saul. All right, cheers. So that was Saul Griffith, engineer, inventor, advisor, author, and evangelist for electrifying everything. As always, we've put into the show notes links to the episodes and resources mentioned in our conversation. So that's Saul's 2021 book, Electrify, and The Big Switch, published in 2022, as well as The Wires That Bind, which sounds dodgy, but is in fact his 2023 essay on community electrification. We've included a link to episode 145 of Cleaning Up, in which I talk to Bridgetown initiator Professor Avinash Persaud about how to close the funding gap for climate solutions in the global south. And finally, the second part of my two-part essay for Bloomberg NEF, entitled Net Zero Will Be Harder Than You Think and Easier, in which I describe the five superheroes of the transition, of which the fifth is, of course, the primary energy demand fallacy, as well as its audio adaptation, which was Cleaning Up Audio Blog number 12. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to Cleaning Up or leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. And do please spread the word. Tell your friends and colleagues. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, as well as by the Liebreich Foundation, the Gilardini Foundation, and our newest supporter, Ecopragma Capital.